J.T. Crowley is talking books. On the show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley host of Talking Books, and today I'm welcoming Charles Palaki from Melbourne, Australia. Charles has written the book End Times, a reference to the book of Revelations. Now, of course, Revelations is the last book in the New Testament and also in the Christian Bible. Charles is not a naturalized Australian, for in fact, he was born in Keshmet, 1939, in Hungary, to a German mother and a Hungarian father. He grew up in war-torn Hungary in Germany and emigrated to an Australia when he was around about 10. He arrived at Port Phillip Bay, Melbourne, on his 10th birthday, in actual fact. And from there, the family were shipped by train to Bone Gilla refugee camp, where Charles first learnt to speak English. He attended the German Lutheran Church as well as the Hungarian Reformed Church, But one thing um, he recalls is why no one ever challenged him about what he thought of God. He graduated at the universities of Melbourne and Tasmania in chemistry and biophysics, respectively, with a doctorate to follow. He met his wife, Czech-born teacher, Malana, who sadly passed away a few months ago. His sons, Paul and Jennifer, have pretty much followed him in his footsteps of the scientific background. So let's invite him onto the show to talk to him a bit about himself and his book, End Times, and really why he wrote it, uh, why he felt so strongly that he had to write this book. Dr. Charles, please join me on the show. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're very, very, very welcome. Dr. Charles, I want to ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, I think it's fair enough to say that some of the contents within your book are quite controversial. And when I look at your life, you certainly split opinion amongst your fellow peers, read your thoughts, views, around creation and evolution. In your prologue, in fact, your opening line is, because what I'm about to share here might surprise or even anger some, I need to establish first that I am in no way questioning the salvation of those who are in Christ, the born again believers in his word. What do you say here? Well, um... I am controversial, but it's only controversial because I believe the Bible literally. Now, I can distinguish between reality and symbolism. uh, And unfortunately, I feel the gospel and the Bible have been watered down over the last decades especially. And so when I bring up biblical aspects because I follow the word of God, people think it's a controversy. And, um, you know, I I attended a uh, church meeting uh, where a famous physicist was talking about creation. And I attended because I thought, oh, you know, this is really good. He'll bring uh, physical evidence about the world created according to the word of God. But he totally ignored the books of Genesis. And at the end, when I asked, but what about this and what about that verse? It totally contradicts your view on creation because it's totally evolutionary. It doesn't follow the Bible. And, of course, the entire congregation, including the minister, got very angry with me. I've got a lot of uh, nasty looks going my way, and I think people wished I'd never attended (laughs) because I'm I'm telling them what's in the Bible, you know, and uh, let's stick to the Bible because I think there's harmony between science and the Bible. 
and this professor had no right to change his entire view, and he was supposed to be the guest speaker of the Church of Christ. So I bring controversy because I, I remind them what's in the Scripture. Of course, the book of Revelations is quite a complex and absorbing book, isn't it? And, of course, it cross-references, you know, um, like you do. There's an awful lot of cross-referencing in your book to other parts of the Bible, you know, poignant cross-references. So it's quite a controversial um, and interesting book, isn't it, Revelations? It is. Uh, it's fascinating. I don't fully understand it. I don't make a claim to fully understand it. But I intend to show people what is already clear in the book of Revelation. I think God is still going to unfold his mystery, but there's also so much that is abundantly clear that ought to be tackled in the churches now. Um, your book, um, Dr. Charles, um, a few people have said when I've looked at your, um, your feedback, and when I've looked at the book, I think I agree with them. It's not a book, really, is it, to be read like a, a good novel. Um, it's more of, um, for me, it was more of an anthology of your biblical research, your personal views and insights, as you examine the whole of Scripture to reveal the true meaning of the prophetic days as seen in the Genesis early chapters. This is how I see your book. Am I right here? And I, I needed to get Genesis in here as well. No, you're absolutely right. It was never meant to be a novel, like a story on an unfolding story. Uh, it was um, getting to the truth of the matter by bringing up supporting facts and scriptures from the Bible and the occasional scientific fact as well. So it's, it's to be thought-provoking Almost like a reference book where people can go back and have a look at this. Your book is teeming with information. It's teeming with um, very interesting thoughts and views. And I say to everybody, go and have a look at the book. It is fascinating. It's beautifully laid out, but there is lots in there. Um, but what I... What I when I have a look at the book, uh, Dr. Charles, um, End Times, the first part of the book talks in detail with significant references to various scriptural passages in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible to nations um, that reveal that the Lord's coming is nigh. And that the second or latter stages of the book are focused on the standards that Christ is looking for in the bride of Christ and the timing of her appearance in the world and how that spells that we are, the end is near. Do you want to embellish um, a little bit more here on why you set the book up like this? Part one and two? The first controversy I wanted to tackle mm. is this widely held belief in the Christian community that the days of creation were 24-hour solar days. And I've talked to the head of the CEO of one of the biggest creationist organizations, and I, I argued that with him, and he had to admit at the very end that actually he knows that the early church fathers believed that each of those days, or, or God's days, from God's perspective, are 1,000-year days, even as the Apostle Peter said in, second, in 2 Peter uh, chapter, three, chapter 8, verse 3, I believe. And, uh, and I, I support it with scriptural arguments that, you know, when uh, Adam sinned, he didn't die that very day. It took him 930 years to die. Now, people say, well, he died spiritually, so, uh, so he died. But no, uh, I, I provide a, a graph uh, taking all the biblical lifespans that I could find in the Bible and from Bishop Usher, the days when they were actually born. And I drew a graph and I showed how for the first, until Noah's flood, the average lifespan of people was in the 900s of years. 
you know, Methuselah lived 969 years, but he didn't make it to the first God's day. He didn't make it 2,000 years. None of the patriarchs did. Now, after the flood, God, uh, well, uh, cursed, if you want to, <laughs> it's a curse. He cursed the world even further because he destroyed the world that then was because of all the violence. And he uh, limited man's lifespan even further. And when you plot this chart, you can see that after Noah's flood, man's lifespan declined very, very rapidly to what it is now. And uh, if you showed that graph to scientists in any area of scientific endeavor, if they got a graph like that, they would say, well, this is believable because the curve goes beautifully like that. Mm. And, uh, and the correlation is, is very good that in the, before Noah's flood, man could live almost to 1,000 years, but not make it, not ever make it to 1,000 years. So God's promise was absolutely true, true, that the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die in that day. And they did. They did. Adam only made it to 930 years. Long time to us. But let's face it, in eternity, we'll be living forever. So what's 930 years? Uh, because before Adam sinned, he could have lived forever and ever. And death only came in when he sinned. So 930 years was nothing in those days. But after the flood, uh, when God cursed the world further and the environment changed incredibly then, uh, man's... Uh, age limit declined very rapidly. You know, it went down to 300 years to the sons of Noah, then about 150 years in the days of Joshua and those people, and then it leveled out to about 70 years in the New Testament. Now, in your book, that's the time chart or the illustration where it refers to um, 33 people, doesn't it? It does, yes. Yeah, I looked at that. Do you mind if I ask you, because this has always pondered me, do you think that back in the olden days, the old biblical days, you know, the early days when we go back to Adam and Methuselah, do you think a year is the same time period as we think a year is today, or are they shorter? I think they were exactly the same. Uh, we think of them as primitive people, but uh, I think our DNA is of poorer quality than Adam's DNA was because DNA is copied, copied, copied from generation to generation. Our DNA is far more corrupted than theirs was when they were first created. And they were very aware of seasons, agricultural seasons. They knew the difference between summer and spring and autumn. They knew when crops would uh, ripen. They knew when flowers would bloom. They were very aware what a year was. I was just interested to see what your point of view was there. Because yeah. I've often thought about that. <laughs> yeah. they, they weren't confused. They were not primitive people. They only became primitive uh, because the Tower of Babel, which I also believe was true, that people just walked away from God and went their own way. And they became primitive. They became cavemen. The further they walked away from God, the more primitive they became. That's an interesting view. Yeah. Um, in your book, your book contains lots of elaborate illustrations as well as time charts and pictures, all beautifully and cleverly positioned as the book develops. Were the illustrations and charts deliberately put there uh, to reinforce your message or you know, to simplify your message? Because sometimes... Um, to coin the phrase, a picture paints a thousand words. Why did you put them in? Well, for exactly that reason, because I can argue a case, uh, you know, for thousands of years. And as a matter of fact, I concentrate on God's grand plan for the planet Earth. You know, that's, I've got a time chart from the very beginning of creation to the very end. And I, I can say it in so many words, but then it, time chart summarizes it so beautifully that people can picture it in their minds. So I, I think diagrams are very important. I'm a visual person myself, and I think a lot of people are visual. They are. 
I liked the uh, picture of the iceberg. And, you know, and the caption there, everybody, is it's uh, on page 13 of his book. And it's a picture of an iceberg at sea. And the reading that goes in the caption there is reading the Bible at the value is like watching an iceberg without being aware that only 10% is revealed on the surface. Mature readers search out the hidden revelations. Bit like you, isn't it? Yes. I can illustrate that with a Bible study group that I go to at times, you know. Uh, they love to read the scriptures, but they only read it superficially. You know, they say, oh, that's a nice story. And then I tell them, do you realize that this story relates back to the book of Revelation? And, uh, and do you realize that this relates back to what happened in the days of Moses, in the tabernacle of Moses? And they say, oh, no, we don't, we don't want to hear about that. Let, let's just read this nice passage from Luke. You know, it's, it's great. And that's all we need today. We don't need to go into all the details. And, and that's why I put that picture there about the iceberg, that the Bible is so much hidden information. God has hidden in his word everything, including the time of the second coming, the, the creation, the entire lifespan of planet Earth. It's all there if you look for it, but you have to look deeper. And that's the whole point of the iceberg picture, isn't it? That is, yes. Um, throughout your book, you often refer to genealogy, especially Adam and 32 more significant more people, which we've already talked about. That's the time chart one. You talk about the process of aging and dying is absent when we are in a totally sinless state. And a few lines down, you talk about DNA molecules being pre-coded, like code programs for computers to perform specific tasks. Um, and your plants are genetically programmed to die after they're flowered and seed. And God, you say, now God has done the same with man. I'm referring to page 37 and 38 in your book. Would you like to tell us more behind your thinking here? I think you've already touched slightly upon it. Well, lifespan is very much determined, taking everything else equal the environment equal, lifespan is very much determined by DNA. So you've got the bristlecone pine that can live to uh, 6,000 years, or you've got an annual plant that is predetermined to die as soon as it flowers within one year. That's why it's called an annual. Then you've got biannual plants that die after two seasons. And, and, and it's all in the DNA. That's why it doesn't matter how well you feed a mouse, you can't extend its lifespan. You can give it a better life and make it fatter, and maybe it will survive some diseases better, but eventually it will die and your pet is gone in a, in a, within a year or so because that's their lifespan as determined by DNA. And it's the same with people. And that's why, you see, when Adam and Eve... Uh, were created, they were given eternal life because there was no sin. It says uh, death came in because of sin. So as soon as they disobeyed God, God suddenly cursed them that the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. And that came to pass. And then when the earth became very violent just before the flood, that's why God destroyed the flood, that he found only one righteous man in the whole planet Earth. And that was Noah and his family. And so he destroyed everybody else. Only eight people were saved on the ark. And, and then he allowed the DNA to deteriorate further. And our lifespans have come down to, what, 70 or 80 years? And maybe with good medication and good nourishment, we can live to 110. But there, there's an upper limit. And in the New Testament, uh, there was this uh, lady, uh, I think a prophetess, she lived to 88 years, and the New Testament says that she was a very old lady. So 88 years was very old in the days of Jesus. Well, when we look at the Bible in the New Testament, of course, we think of Jesus 
And his public ministry started, they say, when he was 30. And of course, when he uh, was crucified on the cross, they say he was around about 33. And he was an old man, wasn't he? Well, uh, the reason he started his ministry at 30 was because it's prophetic. Levites in the Old Testament were only allowed to serve in the temple from the age of 30. So Jesus was fulfilling the law. He was going to be a priest uh, to God, and so he had to be 30 before he began his public ministry. So when he died at the age of 35, uh, I suppose uh, he would have, would have been considered middle age in those days. Interesting thought. Um, because I, I certainly think that you know, we're not put on this planet to be here forever and a day, are we? God's plan is not to put us here forever and a day. No. Would you agree? I, I agree. God has given us a limited time on this earth. He's testing our response to him. It's a, it's a testing process. Our, our whole life, are we going to obey him or are we going to rebel against him? And, and that will be the critical factor as to where people end up in eternity. So it's a, it's, it's a crucible of fire, if you like, because we go through so many trials and, and tribulations in our daily lives. We face them all the time, whether you're a Christian or not. And, uh, and the question is, are we going to remain true to God or not? And, and that's what he's looking for. You know, our obedience to his word. Um, love and to love our neighbours, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. In the second part of uh, the book, you talk about lessons about the bride of Christ, uh, trademark of the maker, to whom will the Lord appear? Uh, prepare the way of the Lord. You know, where is the anointing? You touch on a whole raft of areas within this second part of your book, you know, within Revelations. You know, that's why your book's called End Times. God's great plan. Are these areas so important to you that you put, that's the reason why you put them in the book? That's the whole reason, essentially, why I wrote the book, John. Because if you read Revelations 11, 12, and 13, those chapters, it clearly shows that God is going to divide Christians into three definite groups just before the end. Now, two of those groups are going to be protected by God from all the horrors that are going to come upon planet Earth. But a third group, because they're, they've been lukewarm all their lives, just like the church at Laodicea in the book of Revelation, that because of their lukewarmness, God will put them into a, a terrible situation. And, and the book of Revelation says that this is God's will, that they will have to face this so-called Antichrist, the 666 beast. They will have to choose whether to take on the mark of the beast, which will be some kind of authority from the government to allow you to buy and sell. Now, just imagine if you're a family man and you're not allowed to buy or sell because you didn't take on the mark of a beast, well, what is your family going to tell you? You know, you no food on the table. So uh, people will have to make a, a terrible decision. And I'm thinking especially of the family person. They'll have to make a terrible decision for their family whether they'll take on this mark of the beast or not. As if they take on the mark of the beast, there's immediately food on the table. And they'll get their brand new calm. See, I, when, I, when I look at your book, the third group of people that I think you're referring to, these are the um, people who say, oh, well, we go to church every day, or we do this, and we do you know, little bits of good work here and there. Um, but for the vast majority of us, that fits the mold. But then we don't look into... You know, a bit like the iceberg, we don't look um, deeper enough to uh, understand more. There's an awful lot of us in that group, isn't there? Well, there is. You know, uh, looking at my own church, uh, I, I can see people who are, who are really all out for God. And, 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 and there are some who just come along on Sundays and they're wonderful people. Look, there's nothing wrong with them. But 
you know, you invite them to his Bible study. Oh, no, you know, that's our day off. Oh, no, we're planning a holiday. Uh, they're just not interested. They're, they're happy enough to receive the benefits of Christ. If they're sick, they'll ask the church, oh, please pray for me. But that's where it sort of stops. You know, there's no incentive or enthusiasm to look into the word further, to go to a deeper Bible study. What is God really after in our lives? You know, what will decide? And so many people say, oh, well, you know, when we believed in Jesus, we're saved and that's it. So it doesn't matter what we do now because we're saved. But actually, all of God's promises in the Bible are conditional. You know, if you do this, if you do that, you know, if you follow me, you know, if you pick up your cross daily. It's, and, and, and the thing that gets me about that book of Revelation is that the standard becomes higher right before the end because it does say that if you take on the mark of the beast, and it says so very clearly in the book of Revelation, you lose your salvation and you'll end up in the lake of fire with Satan and all the demons. So, I have a, um, a friend, Dr. Charles, who's a Christadelphian. And he's often saying to me, um, yes, you, you, know, you follow a Christian life, um, but you, might, um, you should read the Bible more like we do. Um, you know, so I think that comes across quite poignant with what you've just said. Yeah. And he brought me a wonderful present once, and it was a Bible. And he says, you need to read it more. Oh, very good. But, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about the Christadelphians, to tell you the truth. So I don't know where, where there is. But you see, the Bible can be also a dead letter. If you just read it like a scholar, it's no good. It's got to come to the heart. Yes. You know, the message of the Bible has to enter the heart. That's when it becomes real. You have to follow through with actions as well. You do. You, you do. You know. um, for me, um, doing this podcast, Evan, to fit and um, talk about you and your book, Dr. Charles, in, uh, in a podcast, just to give listeners and viewers, you know, a peak, um, a flavor behind the scenes, you know, version of your work and your whole life, um, for me has been challenging. Um, because the book, everybody is teeming with information, it's teeming with facts, it's teeming with lots of wonderful things. Um, you know, with data, ideologies, his thinkings, it's fascinating. Um, but I want to go to the end of your book, the conclusion. You talk about, and we've already briefly touched on this again, large, you know, Christian groups that will fall by the wayside as predictors in the book of Revelation, and that church goers should do more and attend more services, but read more. I know we just touched on that, but I think this is such an important part of your book. And this is why it's in the conclusion. Do you just want to just go a little bit further here on to what we've already just covered? Yes, I think it's a question of drawing nearer to the Lord to have a personal relationship with God. Because uh, I've, I've heard, you know, uh, people are coming from Islam that the God they worship, there was never any personal relationship. But the Christian God, the Lord Jesus, as he came to earth, that's what the word Emmanuel means, the God with us. He wants a personal relationship with us, and that's what we should foster, you know, a personal relationship with him. So when we wake up in the morning, it's almost like asking, well, God, what do you want me to do today? Or uh, I'm supposed to go to this uh, party today. Is there somebody there that you really want me to talk to? And then you listen to the voice of the Lord in your heart. Uh, once or twice I may have had an audible voice, but it's usually it's a feeling in your heart. Yeah, I should talk to Jim, somebody or other, because he's, he's in a spot of trial. Yeah. And, and, and I want to tell him something, but I'm going to use you to tell him. Do you know, on a lighter note... Um, now, you and the former U.S., the late former U.S. President Richard Nixon have something in common, don't you? 
Yeah, I can't take credit for uh, being a friend of Richard Nixon or, or knowing him, but uh, in the 1980s, David Frost of your BBC, uh, you know, who uh, eventually asked Richard Nixon the crucial question whether he knew all about Watergate and whether it was a big cover-up, and Richard Nixon for the first time revealed to David Frost that, yeah, he admitted it. And, you know, that was world news. But anyway, before that, uh, David Frost was sent for about nine months to the TV stations in Australia to, uh, as an honorary guest, to set up some programs. And one of the programs he set up included me, because at that time I created a lot of controversy in Melbourne and newspapers, uh, because I was campaigning against evolution theory at university. And as an academic, you know, the whole of Australia was upset that there was a creationist on staff at one of the universities. And, uh, and so David Frost uh, picked that up and made it a popular uh, half-hour show, I think, a, a debate on evolution and creation. So he brought me and a certain Michael Archer from the University of New South Wales, who represented evolution, and I was going to present creation. So David interviewed us individually and then hosted a, a short uh, debate between the two. Mm. So I got to know David uh, through that program, and that was a real privilege. Uh, that, was, that was excellent. There you go, everyone. The link there was David Frost, but totally different interviews. <laughs> One about Watergate, the other one not. <laughs> Dr. Charles, where can people, where can people get your book? Uh, well, look, it's online. Uh, I, I discovered that the best way to find is you just type into your browser, end times, according to scripture, and you, you sort of have to type in C, initial C, Pelagi, my name, and PhD, and then it comes up straight away. If you put in end times in, of course, it'll, most of books come up on end times. What would they do? So, uh, so end times, according to scripture, initial C, Pallagy, P-A-L-L-A-G-H-Y. And on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. And on Amazon, everybody. Um, yeah. Look, absolutely. Dr. Charles, this brief insight into your religious views, your thinking, uh, stemming back to your early days, has been absorbing um thought-provoking and at times curious for me maybe controversial nevertheless you've uh, you gave me a fascinating read and as i say it's it's not a book to be read like a novel it's more seen as an anthology of personal biblical views and insights and it's been absolutely fascinating but i think everyone when you look at this book, you also need to go to uh, Dr. Um, Palaki's website. Uh, his website is www.creation6000.com because the two really do go side by side. Because when you look at his website and all that is in there, and there's an awful lot in there, you will see where the origins of his book come from. So have a look at his book. Go to his website and you'll get a fascinating overall insights to him and to the book and as to where he's come from, both from a scientific point of view and a religious point of view. All it leaves me now is to say is, Dr. Charles, thank you so much for having the great privilege to interview you, talk to you and learn so much about your fascinating book, End Times. Thank you, John. Can I just add one thing? You may. For my website, they have to type in creation 6000.com. 6000. Numerical. Creation 6000. Yes, it is. It's numerical, everybody, not um, alphabetical. And for 6000, it's there for a reason. I'm not going to tell you. Go on the website and see why it's named 6000. 6000. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome. Well, everybody, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching wherever you are in the world. Stay safe. Until next time, have a good day. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.